I can hear my own voice. Yeah, in my phone, I, I just check in YouTube now. Okay, okay. Uh, so we can uh, start now. I can. Introduce. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, welcome all. Welcome to Dwight Army. Uh, we all are uh, blessed to have uh, Dr. Sahana Ma'am with us today. Uh, welcome, Ma'am. Thank you. And today's topic about uh, hypopigmented lesions. Uh, every white lesions are not with you. So uh, without wasting time, let's over to mentor. Ma'am. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Sahana. And uh, today I'll be mainly talking about hypopigmented lesions other than vitiligo. Because uh, as the heading says, uh, every white lesion is not vitiligo. So if all of us, most of us know about vitiligo, what is it and uh, have a rough idea about what it is. But before branding uh, the diagnosis or stamping the diagnosis on any patient as vitiligo, we need to make sure of the diagnosis because of the social stigma which is associated with vitiligo. So today I'll be dealing with the other hypopigmented uh, lesions which occur commonly. Uh, just brushing the basics, melanocytes are the main cells which are involved in any hypopigmented uh, disorder. They are mainly present on the basal layer of the epidermis, the hair bulb and the outer root sheath of the hair follicles. So there are two important uh, values or ratios that we need to know here. One is the melanocyte keratinocyte ratio that is 1 is to 10. So what this means is that for every melanocyte, there are 10 keratinocytes which are present. The other important value which we need to know is the epidermal melanin unit. So what this exactly means, I'll explain in the uh, next slide by a photograph so that you'll understand better. So here you can see this is a melanocyte and for every 10 keratinocytes, there is one melanocyte. So this is the usual melanocyte keratinocyte ratio. And this is an image showing the epidermal melanin unit, which I said is 36. So what this means is, so we all know that basically a melanocyte is a neuronal cell and it has many dendrites and axons. So one melanocyte supplies 36 kerat keratinocytes. That is, it gives out its processes and there are melanosomes going to 36 keratinocytes. So uh, these two values are just important. Melanocyte keratinocyte ratio is 1 is to 10, whereas epidermal melanin unit is 1 is to 36. So, uh, there are two main types of hypopigmented disorder. One is melanocytopenic and one is melanopenic. Let's just understand what this means. Melanocytopenic is there is reduced or absent melanocytes. This is basically a disorder of the melanocytes. What melanopenic means is the number of melanocytes is normal. There is nothing wrong with the melanocytes, but once the formation of melanosome happen, the transfer, the transfer to keratinocytes is deficient. So there is a deficient transfer. So this is a melanopenic disorder. So these two, uh, differentiation between these two is important. <clears throat> Coming to the approach. Now, these are the general questions which we should keep in mind while examining any patient with a hypopigmented disorder. The first thing we have to ask the patient is whether it is congenital or acquired, that is whether the lesions are present since birth or they appear at a later age, whether they are localized or diffused, whether they are present in only a single area so the, I will be talking about the relevance of each of these questions as we proceed further, whether the lesion is a single lesion or whether it is diffuse. We have to also examine each lesion and see whether they are ill-defined or they are well-defined. And we have to, have to also observe the pattern. That is, is there a linear pattern? Is there a segmental pattern? We have to also ask for history of prior inflammation or any prior disorders because you will be finding out about the relevance of these further. Any, any dermatological condition can result in hypopigmentation later. So this question is very important. 
whether there was any history of exposure to medications or chemicals, or there is any concomitant systemic disease, most commonly autoimmune diseases like thyroid disorders, connective tissue disorders. So these are uh, some of the things which are uh, which I will be dealing in the further classes. Vitiligo, because vitiligo itself is a uh, very big uh, seminar. The uh, etiopathogenesis of vitiligo, the types of vitiligo, clinical features, the medical and surgical management. So this, these are some of the topics which I will be dealing in the further classes. The genetic causes of hypopigmentation. I'll just be very briefly telling you some of the names of the genetic causes. So one is ocular albinism. Second one is oculocutaneous albinism. Pybaldism and Wardenberg syndrome. So these are the important ones which we need to keep in mind about when it comes to the genetic causes of hypopigmentation. Then developmental anomalies. There are two important developmental anomalies of hypopigmentation that we need to Keep in mind. So they are called as nevus depigmentosis and nevus anemicus. So again, I will be discussing uh, all these things in the further seminars. So today, what we'll be mainly discussing is the acquired causes of hypopigmentation. So when it comes to acquired hypomelanosis, these are all the different conditions which can cause acquired hypopigmentation, infections, inflammations, chemical causes, endocrine and nutritional causes, post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, malignancy, and some miscellaneous reasons. So let us uh, study each one in detail. Coming to infections, so there are, it can be divided as fungal, bacterial, parasitic and viral. So the, uh, I'll just tell you about the name of the condition and the organism causing it. The fungal infection is called as pityriasis versicolor and it is caused by something called as malassezia furfur. The bacterial causes of hypopigmentation are leprosy which is caused by mycobacterium leprae syphilis which is caused by treponema pallidum yaws which is caused by treponema pertenu and pinta which is caused by treponema caratium these are the main bacterial causes of hypopigmentation moving on to parasitic there is something called as post kala azar Dermal leishmaniasis. So this is a sequelae of leishmaniasis which occurs due to leishmania donovani. There's an entity called as post kalaza dermal leishmaniasis. We will discuss about this further. The other parasitic cause is oncocerciasis. Viral, viral, the viral cause is a very new entity which was described in 2019. There is something called as eruptive hypomelanosis. We will let's talk about each one of this in detail. So coming to the first condition, uh, pityriasis versicolor. It was previously known as tenia versicolor, but this term is not used anymore. So here, the primary lesion has. Let's look at the picture. So they are oval shape or circular hypopigmented lesions and as you can see they are all oriented in a certain way the distribution is mainly over the trunk or the back where the uh, sebaceous glands are present in excess so how do we differentiate uh, pityriasis versicolor from vitiligo so the first thing is there is scaling in these lesions and the distribution is mainly perifollicular so clinically, these are the two differentiating points between pityriasis versicolor and vit uh, vitiligo. And uh, if uh, you want to know why there is hypopigmentation in pityriasis versicolor, it is because of this azelaic acid, which is produced by the 
fungus malassezia furfur like i said malassezia furfur is the causative organism of pityriasis fasicular so malassezia furfur produces a acid which is known as azelaic acid which leads to the hypopigmentation Right. So there, other than clinical methods, there are a lot of other bedside investigations which we can do in order to differentiate between the various causes of hypopigmentation. So this is something called as a Wood's lamp. This device is a Wood's lamp. So this emits ultraviolet radiations of specific wavelength. The peak wavelength it emits is 365 nanometers. So what this does is it fluoresces. There is Uh, fluorescence of any pathology. So, Wood's lamp is used for the diagnosis of a lot of different conditions, mainly vitiligo or fungal infections like tinea capitis, pityriasis vesicular. It is also used for the diagnosis of porphyrias. So, Wood's lamp is a whole different class. Just remember that, or in pityriasis vesicular, there is a yellowish fluorescence. Yellowish fluorescence on Wood's lamp, whereas vitiligo lesions. Give right, give rise right to pearly white. So pearly white in vitiligo, whereas sorry for that, pearly white in vitiligo, whereas yellowish fluorescence in vitiligo is vascular. There is also another bedside investigation which we can do, which is known as a KOH mount. So, what is this KOH mount? It is known as potassium permanganate mount. So, we scrape the lesion with the help of a glass slide, and we place the material on another glass slide, and we put one or two drops of ten percent potassium hydroxide, and we observe it under a microscope. So, what potassium hydroxide does is it dissolves the keratinocytes and the other debris which might be present. So that only the fungal element is left. So there are a lot of appearances in dermatology. So this specific one, which we see in pityriasis vesicular, is known as spaghetti and meatball appearance. I've put a picture of uh, spaghetti and meatball here so that you can compare. You need a You need vivid imagination to actually get these uh, references. So this is known as a spaghetti and meatball appearance. Remember that spaghetti and meatball appearance comes in pityriasis vesicular on KOH mount. So these are the different ways: this clinical and Wood's lamp and KOH mount by which you can differentiate between pityriasis vesicular and vitiligo. Okay, so now let's move on to leprosy. Leprosy is a very huge topic by itself. um so what we have to remember here is any patient who comes with hypopigmented lesions like this who's from an endemic area we all know that india is endemic for leprosy even in india there are a lot of states which are endemic for leprosy so uh, we cannot diagnose leprosy only on the basis of hypopigmented lesions there are three cardinal features for the diagnosis of leprosy so one of them is hypopigmented lesions the other one is nerve involvement nerve involvement either in the form of loss of sensations or nerve thickening and the third one is demonstration of acid fast bacilli i'll just show you a picture of the acid fast bacilli so these are the acid fast bacilli which is nothing but mycobacterium leprae and the stain which we use for diagnosis of acid fast bacilli is zn zn is zeal nielsen stain so this is like a very brief overview of uh, leprosy leprosy is a whole different seminar by itself which i will be taking in the further classes so just remember that uh, there is a high degree of clinical suspicion required to diagnose leprosy some of the methods which can help us are nerve examination and detection of acid fast bacilli let's move on syphilis so there are a lot of stages of syphilis syphilis happens as primary syphilis secondary syphilis and tertiary syphilis so hypopigmented lesions are mainly seen in secondary syphilis this is the, these are the lesions of secondary syphilis this is called as leucoderma syphiliticum you can see the hypopigmented macules here <coughs> okay 
there is also something known as the necklace of venus which are hypopigmented macules on the neck so this is a image of necklace of venus so again syphilis cannot be diagnosed only by the presence of hypopigmented lesions you need a high degree of clinical suspicion and also the other features of syphilis just remember that hypopigmented lesion can occur in syphilis moving on to um, other treponemal infections like pinta and yaws these are forgotten tropical diseases we don't see cases of pinta or yaws anymore in india these are very much uh, still present in some countries of um, africa i just want to show you an interesting case which was published in a recent dermatology journal so this patient was treated as vitiligo by a lot of dermatologists given lot of uh, corticosteroids and immunosuppressants uh, but there was no um, improvement and uh, later on uh, doing a biopsy of the lesions there were a lot of and on other examination uh, investigations like dark ground microscopy he was diagnosed as a case of yaws again uh, yaws and pinta and syphilis leprosy all these bacterial infections cannot be diagnosed only by looking at hypopigmented lesions what we need to remember here are is that hypopigmented lesions can also occur in all these conditions now <clears throat> coming on moving on to a very new topic something called as progressive macular hypomelanosis so why is this under why is this under bacterial infection because this is hypothesized to be caused by a bacteria which is known as propioni bacterium acne uh, so now all of you must know that propioni bacterium acne is what is responsible for acne so this also causes another condition which is very recently described again known as progressive macular hypomelanosis so this was a patient of progressive macular hypomelanosis so by looking at this patient for the first time um, uh the obvious dds which come to mind are vitiligo or pityriasis versicolor but then progressive macular hypomelanosis is a diagnosis of exclusion so we only diagnose pmh only after uh, doing a wood slam doing a koh mount doing a skin biopsy after ruling out all the other causes of hypopigmentation so because it is caused by a uh area that is propioni bacterium acne the treatment is topical amycin or topical benzoyl peroxide which we usually use for the treatment of acne so remember this condition progressive macular hypomelanosis so moving so these were the bacterial infections just uh, recollecting it very quickly the fungal infection was pityriasis versicolor bacterial was leprosy syphilis yaws pinta and a uh, newer thing progressive macular hypomelanosis the parasitic infections is post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis which is a sequel or a long term complication of visceral leishmaniasis it is caused by a parasite which is known as leishmania donovani so there are two major presentations of post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis monomorphic and polymorphic so these are the monomorphic macules which were present on a tongue in a patient of leishmaniasis when these monomorphic when these very small monomorphic lesions coalesce here you can see the formation of a polymorphic lesion so the bigger ones are called as polymorphic lesions so these are polymorphic lesions formed by the coalescence of monomorphic lesions so the distribution is also very typical around the knees feet elbow and hands again post kala azar dermal leishmaniasis has many other symptoms and uh, signs other than hypopigmented lesion there is a classical facial appearance lot of other systemic symptoms by so you need to uh, look at the whole picture before we diagnose any condition moving to onco cerciasis again it is a, a parasitic infection which is caused by onco cerca volvulus So there is this appearance is known as a leopard skin appearance. That is, so this is a leopard skin. So there are interspersed hypopigmented macules among hyperpigmented areas. So 
there is both hypo and hyperpigmented skin so this is also known as a salt and pepper salt and pepper or a leopard skin so there are two places in dermatology where this comes so we just saw one one is oncocerca oncocerciasis the other important one is scleroderma so patients with scleroderma also have the same sort of salt and pepper appearance that is hypopigmented macules among hyperpigmented areas next moving on to viral so the just recapping the two parasitic infections causing hypopigmentation which we saw were post kalaza dermal leishmaniasis and oncocerciasis now uh, eruptive hypomelanosis is a very newly described condition Uh, in 2019 so this is something which is known as a paraviral exanthem so now what what is a paraviral exanthem all of you know what is a viral exanthem a viral exanthem is a rash which happens over the cutaneous areas following a viral infection there is a viral enanthem there are two terminologies here exanthem and enanthem Exanthem is something which happens on the cutaneous surface, whereas enanthem is something which happens on the mucosa. So, if you see a rash on the oral mucosa, if you see a rash on the genital mucosa, if if there is conjunctival redness, then it is called as an enanthem. So, paraviral exanthem is something which is not exactly proved that it happens because of a virus, but there are multiple factors pointing towards a viral etiology. For example. there is a presiding history of uh, urti and fever uh, there is sudden onset of uh, lesions and there is spontaneous resolution without any treatment or with just symptomatic treatment so this is known as a paraviral exanthem so now this was a uh, this was the child from which this terminology came into place eruptive hypomelanosis so he presented 3 uh, weeks after a bout of fever and uh, urti with the sudden eruptions of small hypopigmented macules which were mainly distributed on the extremities so after doing a skin biopsy after doing wood slab koh after ruling out all the other causes of hypopigmentation he was just given sent home with an emollient and asked to come back after two weeks and after two weeks there was complete resolution of all the lesions which proved uh, the viral etiology of this condition now just as a side note what are uh, there are a lot of paraviral exanthems which you see in dermatology which are actually important from a clinical point of view from an exam point of view as well so the most popular one paraviral exanthem is pityriasis rosea so the other one we just saw eruptive hypomelanosis there is just i know that all these uh, terminologies are a little complicated but just try to remember that there is something called as geonadi crosti syndrome three important paraviral now that was everything about infections now let's move on to the next category of uh, hypopigmented lesions inflammations so pityriasis alba so what all of us know about pityriasis alba as an undergraduate uh, what knowledge we have is that any whitish looking patch on the face is something to do with nutrition either it's a nutritional cause or what we usually uh, used to prescribe is something like albendazole so uh, pityriasis alba is actually nothing uh, to do with nutrition it's actually an inflammatory condition and it is also a minor criteria for atopic dermatitis so before it was thought to be nutritional now it is thought to be an inflammatory condition and it is a minor criteria for the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis so uh, the clinical features are ill defined macules and patches uh, it all you can also find some mild scaling on clo closer examination and the children usually have pruritus it is usually found on the photo exposed areas like the face the uh, uncovered part of the arms and the upper trunk more commonly seen in darker skin types 
there is always almost a history of atopy and like i said it is a minor criteria for the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis the treatment usually involves just reassuring the parents giving a lot of emollients and if there is inflammation or scaling low potency corticosteroids that was pityriasis alba so that is the only inflammatory condition which causes hypopigmentation now so now there, there's one more thing which i would just like to mention here there are a lot of post inflammatory hypopigmentation there is a terminology which is known as pih pih is post inflammatory hypopigmentation a lot of inflammatory conditions which after resolution cause hypopigmentation but pityriasis alba is an inflammation which causes hypopigmentation so this these are the two different things which we have to keep in mind coming to the next category like i said it was infection inflammation and then the third cause of acquired hypomelanosis was chemicals so the chemical cause of hypomelanosis is termed as chemical leukoderma so there are any chemical and any pharmacological agent can actually cause depigmentation of the skin so the major groups which cause this are phenols catechols or sulfhydrils so the lesions first appear at the primary site of contact but later they even spread to the remote sites and the characteristic lesions are confetti or pea sized macules these are the characteristic name of the lesions in chemical leukoderma so now let's just look at uh, these are the uh, wide list of uh, tables you know all the chemicals which can um, give rise to chemical leukoderma the most common ones which we have to remember here which are common in the indian scenario are this hydroquinone the monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone um, para tertiary butyl phenol hydroquinone phenol and ppd i'll just show you examples where each of these cause chemical leukoderma so this this characteristic lesion which is very commonly seen in the dermatology opd is known as bindu so it usually happens because of the sticker bindis the sticker or the adhesives which are present in the bindi contain this chemical para tertiary butyl phenol para tertiary butyl phenol is the chemical which is responsible for bindi leukoderma it is a very difficult condition to treat because <clears throat> because of the uh, practices which are usually involved in the indian household among indian women you can't ask indian women not to wear bindi so the alternate which we provide is to use the liquid formulation or sindoor the adhesive which are present causes leukoderma Uh, we just have to remember the important chemicals para tertiary butyl phenol so this is because of the leather so leather or rubber by themselves cause leukoderma so this is a this is a lady who was uh, used to keeping the wallet on her chest who developed leukoderma this is because of leather sandals so leather or rubber can cause Now, and this is hair dye leukoderma this is due to the chemical ppd so like i said two three chemical the names of three chemicals which we need to remember this is paraniline diamine ppd ppd causes hair dye hair dye leukoderma and para tertiary butyl phenol causes bindi leukoderma correct this is a uh, type of leukoderma which is only seen in the indian household so so this is something which is known as uh, mehendi or alta leukoderma so this is because of hydroquinone monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone because of the mehendi which is usually applied over the legs okay. so uh, these were the chemical causes of leukoderma the only three chemicals which we need to keep in mind are hydroquinone para tertiary butyl phenol and phenylene diamine okay so next moving on to the next classes so till now we have covered infections inflammations 
uh, and chemical leukoderma coming on to endocrine causes there are uh, two or three conditions which we need to remember which cause uh, hypopigmentation in endocrine diseases that is hyperthyroidism uh sometimes yeah that is hypothyroidism same as graves disease addison's disease and hypopara pituitarism so coming to hypopituitarism uh again it's very difficult to diagnose hypopituitarism or hyperthyroidism or addison's disease by only looking at the cutaneous manifestations you need to look at the overall uh patient and do a very thorough systemic examination but some of the features are uh, hypopituitarism uh, there is hypomelanosis which is more prominent in the genital areas and the skin shows deficient sun tanning and increased sensitivity to sunlight in hyperthyroidism uh, graves disease 7% of patients have depigmented lesion and also vitiligo is more common in patients of hypothyroidism vitiligo like i will discuss when uh, i move on to vitiligo vitiligo is common in patients of any autoimmune condition addison's disease addison's disease is uh, character characteristic of hyperpigmentation not hypopigmentation classically is known as addisonian hyper pigmentation but 15% of patients also develop depigmented macules just uh, just know a few of the causes of hyperpigmentation in endocrine diseases addison's hyperthyroidism and hypopituitarism now let's move on to the nutritional causes again protein deficiency kwashior kor any malabsorption syndrome can cause hypomelanosis uh, so initially there is hypopigmentation and later depigmentation can occur so uh, you must all of you must have heard of the flag sign which is seen in the scalp as well as the skin so scalp uh, flag sign occurs when periods of poor nutrition are interspersed with normal or good nutrition alternating bands of pale and dark hair are seen and it also occurs on the skin um other than uh, the skin hypopigmented lesions on the skin the hair and nails are also affected in nutritional disorders the hair has become dry sparse and brittle so what we need to just keep in mind is nutritional disorders uh, like protein deficiency and malabsorption syndromes can also cause hypopigmentation sometimes yes so next moving on to the next and most important category the most common category which is seen in clinical practice post inflammatory hypopigmentation so like it says is the largest group of hypopigmentary disorders so the cutaneous inflammation can alter the melanosome synthesis melanin production transport and transfer to keratinocytes so every stage of melanosome formation synthesis and transfer is affected in pih so any condition any cutaneous condition can cause a post inflammatory hypopigmentation the most common ones are uh, mechanical and physical causes radiation injury thermal injury inflammatory conditions like vitreous rosea psoriasis eczema lichen planus dle sarcoidosis like i said any skin condition can essentially lead to post inflammatory hypopigmentation so these are a few examples of uh, post inflammatory hypopigmentation so this this patient was a patient of psoriasis who after treatment developed post inflammatory hypopigmentation this was a baby of seborrheic dermatitis you can see the diaper distribution of the rash who developed hypopigmentation <coughs> after treating the seborrheic dermatitis this is uh, image c is, uh, is something called as pityriasis lichenoides chronica And no need to remember all this just remember that any condition can cause a post inflammatory hypopigmentation and remember a few examples psoriasis eczema and this the last patient here this is a patient of dle just remember a few examples of inflammatory conditions which can cause pih so uh, how exactly does pih occur so the more severe the inflammation 
the greater chances of developing post inflammatory hypopigmentation once the underlying inflammatory disorder is effectively treated the pih also gradually resolves there are two conditions where complete depigmentation can be seen this is important for us to remember the other conditions usually cause hypopigmentation depigmentation is seen in atopic dermatitis and discoid lupus erythematosus so we can see from this image so all this can be this is hypopigmentation this is hypopigmentation but this is depigmentation this is depigmentation so dle and atopic dermatitis cause depigmentation all the other conditions cause hypopigmentation how do you how do we treat a case of pih we just reassure the patient we treat the uh, we make sure that the underlying disorder is treated completely now coming to the one of the last categories malignancy there is an entity which is known as mycosis fungoids mycosis fungoids is the most common type of primary cutaneous t cell lymphoma it is a cutaneous t cell lymphoma so there are a lot of variants of uh, mycosis fungoids granulomatous pustular purpuric varicose bullous and hypopigmented like hypopigmented is one of the variants of mycosis fungoids <laughs> so it it can be hypopigmented or it can be depigmented it mainly occurs over the trunk proximal extremities buttocks and the pelvic girdle so this is known as a bathing trunk distribution bathing trunk bathing trunk distribution is trunk proximal extremities buttocks and pelvic girdle and these lesions are usually protetic so you can see here this was a again a high degree of clinical suspicion is required so you need to look at the patient overall an elderly patient who has uh, other symptoms like weight loss cachexia and hypopigmented skin lesions mycosis fungoids is something which we need to keep in mind <coughs> skin biopsy is one of the very important investigations which we use for diagnosing any skin condition uh, i'll be taking a separate uh, class on uh, um the histopathological findings of normal skin and some of the common dermatological conditions so uh, <clears throat> i just want to talk here about the um, biopsy findings of mycosis fungoids so this finding here is something called as parakeratosis so what is parakeratosis usually the stratum corneum the stratum corneum which is the topmost layer of the skin does not have any nuclei so when there is impaired formation of the stratum corneum there is retention of nuclei within the stratum corneum and that is termed as parakeratosis parakeratosis is an important finding of mycosis fungoids and what is this b b is the presence of lymphocytes so all these small cells which we can see is lymphocytes so lymphocytes the presence of lymphocytes lymphocytes should not be present in the epidermis lymphocytes so this this is the epidermis and this is the dermis lymphocytes can be present in the dermis but when they are present in the epidermis it is known as epidermotropism epidermotropism and this is the characteristic feature of any cutaneous t cell lymphoma epidermotropism that is there is migration of the lymphocytes from the dermis to the epidermis and what is c c is a inflammatory infiltrate in the dermis so these are the uh, very briefly very brief histopathological findings the one which we need to remember here of importance is epidermotropism happens in mycosis fungoids or any cutaneous t cell lymphoma yeah <clears throat> coming to some miscellaneous entities so till now we have discussed infections inflammations uh, chemical causes endocrine and nutritional causes um, post inflammatory hypopigmentation and malignancy then some miscellaneous conditions there is something called as idiopathic gutta hypomelanosis so this is a condition which i am sure at least 50 to 60% of us have so it is it is mainly a a uh, disorder of aging it is seen in 80% of patient over the age of 70 years so the typical lesion i just show you some images it is this well circumscribed white 
pinpoint macule which usually occurs over the photo exposed area the outer part of the arm or the shin i'm sure if all of us check uh, we'll have one or two of such uh, lesions so like i said uh, the typical lesion is a circumscribed sharply defined asymptomatic the characteristic color which is uh, used to describe igh is porcelain white porcelain white macule so on in histopathology there is marked reduction or absence of melanin granules in the basal and suprabasal layers and there is also reduction in the melanocytes <clears throat> so like i told you about two terminologies in the beginning melanocytopenic and melanopenic so igh is something which is both there is reduction in the number of melanocytes as well as reduction in the number of melanosomes so this is idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis and how do we treat idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis uh, there is no effective treatment we just reassure the patient that this is a normal process of aging there are a lot of surgical methods which can be tried like prp and derma roller but it is usually not necessary reassurance is what is required and there is another term which is known as vagabond's leukomelanoderma which usually occurs in elderly patients in which dietary deficiency along with lack of cleanliness and heavy infestation with lice that is pediculus humanus occur so patients have small macules of hypomelanosis which are superimposed on hypermelanosis usually seen in areas like wrists axilla groin medial thighs or the posterior neck yeah <clears throat> uh, again one of the miscellaneous conditions is voronoff's ring so this is an important terminology which needs to be remembered voronoff ring is a halo let me show you the image so this is a halo of hypopigmentation which usually occurs around the psoriatic lesion due to the treatment due to any topical treatment the psoriasis is usually treated with topical corticosteroids or topical calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus so what this does is it produces a ring of hypopigmentation around these lesions which is known as voronoff's ring there is an element of vasoconstriction but it is uncertain whether there is any decrease in pigmentation these are all included just under the miscellaneous disorders voronoff's ring yeah so the important um, bedside investigations i won't say bedside the important investigations which we need to do in any patient who comes with hypopigmented lesion are a wood slam examination i already uh, spoke about a, what is a wood slam how does it work what are the conditions in which uh, wood slam can be used uh, i also spoke about koh mount and about the skin biopsy so what is this dermoscopy the dermoscope dermoscope is called a dermatologist stethoscope the dermoscope is like a microscope so this is the dermoscope which i use uh, it is like a handheld microscope or it is like a uh, retinoscope which enhances the lesion so there are specific magnifications 10x 40x and 100x which can be magnified to see the lesion so dermoscope is a very new upcoming branch of dermatology and it is <coughs> uh, gradually replacing skin biopsy so it is a non invasive technique you actually don't need to subject the patient to the painful procedure of taking a biopsy the invasive procedure of taking a biopsy is a very non invasive method which is replacing almost all the other investigations for diagnosis in dermatology so what is the take home message from um, this uh, seminar apart from learning a lot of new causes i'm sure new and rare causes of hypopigmentation we need to do a complete clinical and a systemic examination before jumping to the diagnosis of vitiligo so like i said bedside investigations which are very simple instruments which you'll find in any dermatology opd like a wood slam or a koh mount or a dermoscope they are actually a boon for the diagnosis of hypopigmented skin lesions so before we diagnose before we stamp the diagnosis of vitiligo or even leprosy uh, on a patient we have to understand the mental state and the stigma which go along with diagnosing these conditions so we need to be very sure and counsel the patient uh, <clears throat> who comes with hypopigmented lesions 
these are uh, i've just included the, these uh, slides to just uh, uh, let you know what classes i'll be taking in the coming weeks the next class will be on the genetic disorders of hyperpigmentation like uh, the many syndromes which i uh, told you about in the beginning vitiligo vitiligo is a whole big seminar by itself and i also want to talk about the common dermoscopy findings in dermatology because it's a very new thing and <clears throat> something which all of us need to be aware of uh, so thank you so if uh, you have any doubt or uh, any other topics which uh, need to be included or taken in the upcoming classes you can either uh, email me or you can email the white army's uh, uh, youtube page thank you Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful session. We want to have more sessions with you, ma'am. Thank ma you. Th there is one question, ma'am. One or two. Yeah. Ma'am, any con uh, congenital pigmentation, deep pigmentation? Correct, correct. So there are a lot of congenital deep pigmentation disorders. I will be taking a se whole separate seminar on that next week. Ah, okay, ma'am. And uh, one in June. Why scaling is there in oh, in one of the slide scaling? Why scaling is there? Yes. yes so, uh, <clears throat> so scaling, uh, scaling can be there in a lot of things. So, see this pityriasis vesicular is one of the conditions where scaling is present. Um, scaling can be pre also in. I showed you mycosis fungus. Yeah. Pityriasis alba, scaling can be present in pityriasis vesicular, pityriasis alba, and it can also be present in mycosis fungoids. So what exactly is scaling? Uh, I'll just uh, uh, explain it to you. So scaling is the presence of whitish flakes over the lesions. So why does scaling occur over any, any dermatological lesion? So the... Uh, Histology corresponding to scaling is parakeratosis. So when there is a thickening of the stratum conium, so there are five layers of the skin. Which is explained if you don't know the there is stratum conium, one of the layers. And, correct. This is the stratum conium. So like I said, stratum conium is an enucleated layer. So when there is